Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, especially on such a hot and sticky morning. And a special welcome to those of you who are joining us live online. Uh, we're very excited that you're here today for Where's the Link? Maternal and Child Health Aid and Armed Conflict. I'm Megan Parker. I'm the Senior Writer Editor and the Partnerships Director for the Environmental Change and Security Program here at the Wilson Center, and I also work with our Maternal Health Initiative. And I'm, I'm very pleased to be welcoming you here today for such an important conversation about maternal health and armed conflict. Um, and if you didn't pick it up, we just published a three-part series on the topic on New Security Beat, and there's copies outside, and if you're watching online, they're at newsecuritybeat.org. Before we begin, I'd like to share just a few words about where you're sitting. Uh, the Wilson Center is the living formal memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, who was the only president to have a PhD. And uh, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary, actually, here this year. Uh, and uh, over that last 50 years, we've uh, sought to meet our mission of bridging the gap between scholarship and policy in the world of international affairs. And we also seek to bridge the gaps between issues as well. And uh, today, this program is a collaboration, as I said, of our Maternal Health Initiative and our Environmental Change and Security Program. And together, we work to uh, champion an interdisciplinary approach to how access to healthcare is connected to our sustainability, our prosperity, and our security and to understanding how conflict, violence, and war can undermine lives and livelihoods in fragile parts of the world. Maternal health is fundamental to a functioning society, but today, as, as every day, uh, when 800 women will die from lack of health care. As a mother who is very lucky to give birth with the best ac uh, medical care in the world, I know how risky it can be for any woman to give birth, and those risks increase exponentially in conflict zones. But by how much? And what is the best way to reduce these risks? We don't know the answers to these questions, but today we have a panel of experts who has uh, done some great research and bringing some experience from the field to tell us what they've learned uh, about these connections and what we can do. Uh, I'd like to very much thank our partners at the Peace Research Institute Oslo, who we've worked with in many years on a wide range of issues, uh, for their support and assistance of this event. And I'm very pleased to introduce you to Henrik Erdahl, who I've known and worked with for many years as well, and who at one point along the way was a fellow here at the center. So we're really glad to have him back again. Uh, his research, which has been published widely in many influential journals, focuses primarily on the impact of population and environmental change on armed conflict, including the security impacts of urbanization, youth bulges, and climate change. And Henrik will tell you a little bit more about Prio. Tom? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Megan, and, and uh, welcome all. Uh, I'm very pleased to see that, uh, that so many of you uh, have turned up for this uh, uh, important uh, event, addressing a very uh, important uh, key issue, as, as Megan alluded to, uh, namely the impact of armed conflict on uh, maternal and child health and what we can do to reduce the suffering uh, from armed conflict. Um, I'm, uh, as, as Megan said, I'm... Um, uh, Henrik Udal, and I'm the current director uh, of the Peace Research Institute in uh, Oslo, but I've also worked extensively on these issues uh, together with my uh, colleagues here for uh, several years. Uh, and I would start uh, by, like to start by uh, thanking uh, the uh, ECSP uh, for uh, joining us in, in organizing this event. Um, the, uh, the, the Prio uh, Wilson uh, collaboration goes back uh, many years and covers a range of different topics. Uh, of uh, great uh, importance, where precisely the exchange of, uh, of research and policy uh, is important. And for those of you who don't know Prio, uh, we are a private nonprofit uh, academic research institute based in Oslo, Norway, um, and uh, specializing on studying the uh, causes and, and consequences of armed conflict. Uh, and we're very proud to, to be partnering with Wilson, which is uh, known as uh, one of the most important and respected bipartisan meeting places for policy and research uh, in the US. Um, and we're also very uh, grateful to, to all our other partners uh, in this meeting uh, for uh, taking up the challenge and, and, uh, and uh, joining us for this important discussion. 
Um, Priu is uh, approaching the issue on today's agenda from the study of the broader humanitarian consequences uh, of conflict uh, and in the area of the uh, Millennium Development Goals. Uh, Priu was a uh, one of the uh, of the uh, uh, sort of major research environments contributing to studying the impact uh, of armed conflict uh, to the extent of whether countries were able to meet the uh, MDGs. Uh, now this engagement is, is uh, extended uh, through the 2030 agenda uh, and the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, where uh, in this context SDG 16 is meeting uh, SDGs 3 and 10, uh, on health and inequality, SDG 16 <laughs> being the um, aim at creating peaceful, just and inclusive societies, which is what we uh, consider to be a so-called uh, enabling uh, goal, uh, in, to the extent that armed conflict today is one of the major obstacles uh, to reach the sustainable development goals. Um, and we can only reach real progress on the 2030, uh, uh, 2030 agenda more broadly if we succeed in making progress on SDG uh, 16. And this is a challenge, of course, uh, that is currently growing as we have seen conflict increasing uh, in a number of uh, countries over the past at least five, six uh, uh, years. While much of the uh, previous research in this area, including a lot of the work that's been done at, at Prio and, and sort of political science research environments, has been aggregate at the sense, uh, at the, in the sense of, of focusing on country level uh, relationships. Um, to what extent countries are being able to meet their targets. Uh, what we've come to uh, realize increasingly is that this uh, approach is overly coarse uh, and that there is a need to understand the variations inside countries uh, where the pockets of needs are and what can be done to meet them. And this requires a, a much more uh, geographically uh, sensitive and uh, disaggregated approach, which is now becoming uh, feasible through the extensive availability of uh, high resolution geographically uh, coded data, both on health and on, on armed conflict and other uh, measures. Uh, as I mentioned, Prio uh, comes to this from uh, the primary concern about the broader humanitarian and human consequences of conflict. Um, this was a, uh, a large research agenda um, on the uh, broader development consequences of armed conflict at the turn of the millennium, not least uh, triggered and inspired by work uh, by the World Bank and also the uh, Human Security Report uh, Project. And the World Bank published in 2003 a, um, a very much cited report on the conflict trap, where the central premise was that underdevelopment and poor governance drives violent conflict, which again weakens governance structures uh, and prospects for uh, development. Uh, and later research done both at Prio and elsewhere has demonstrated indeed that uh, the effects uh, of armed conflict on uh, the MDGs uh, are serious in the way that they're hampering uh, development uh, across uh, the world. Uh, development failures or backsliding caused by armed conflict add to the total uh, human lives lost to conflict, uh, even if indirectly. Conflict researchers, uh, as, as, uh, as Prio and, and the University of Uppsala, uh, typically collect data on direct vic victims of war, or uh, what we often refer to as battle deaths, uh, including both military and civilians. Yet we know that in many conflicts, indirect deaths or uh, excess mortality can be substantial, and in some cases also will surpass those who are killed on the battlefield. Um, and such that indirect deaths can be driven by increases either in uh, non-conflict re uh, related violence by hunger and malnutrition or deterioration uh, in health system, healthcare systems, uh, most uh, strongly affected, uh, affecting often uh, the most marginalized groups like refugees uh, and IDPs. Yet it's exceptionally challenging to estimate uh, total deaths in conflict and of course indirect deaths in particular. Uh, but there are major um, developments uh, in this area. Uh, there is a need, however, to try to understand uh, especially what the baseline is, what the situation uh, is uh, if conflict uh, had not occurred, uh, and is also sort of establishing having monitoring systems that allows you to also uh, get a sense of, of reliably measuring uh, deaths. And uh, uh, there has been a huge um, um, sea change uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, methodological sophistication in being able to, uh, to measure and address these uh, issues uh, more subtly um, in more uh, recent years. Um, there was one notable um, 
uh, finding in particular from some of the early cross-national uh, aggregate work that inspired uh, Prio's work in this area uh, in particular. Uh, and that was that uh, in several studies, mortality among women uh, in some high intensity conflicts was as severe uh, as male mortality, despite the fact that uh, we know from, from uh, most sort of detailed surveys of uh, conflict mortality that uh, the vast majority of those killed either uh, directly in war, uh, but also, uh, sorry, those killed directly in war, whether military or civilians, are male. So um, there must be some other major source of mortality arising from context of uh, war uh, that has a uh, major disproportional um, negative effect on uh, women. Uh, and obviously, uh, maternal health is a very natural place uh, to start. So uh, what we are, the, the background for this, this meeting and, and, and our partnership here is two multi-year, multidisciplinary uh, projects, uh, both funded by the Research Council of Norway. The first one on armed conflict and maternal health in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, with the primary objective uh, of the project being through various analytical approaches to improve our understanding uh, of how conflict affects maternal health and to contribute to identify the most effective strategies uh, to reduce maternal mortality and improve maternal health uh, in conflict and post-conflict context. Uh, some of the core assumptions include uh, the, the assumption that there are uh, various immediate local effects uh, related both to, uh, to the, uh, sort of the onset of conflict intensity, the duration, uh, and also the type of conflict. Conflict comes in, in, in very many different uh, forms. Uh, on maternal health, uh, both directly relating to access to uh, health care, uh, health personnel, uh, personal security, but also indirectly in the form of uh, spillover effects into neighboring uh, areas um, that are not necessarily directly uh, affected by conflict. And then uh, the, the, uh, the assumptions about interventions in the sense of uh, both uh, at the direct level uh, in the sense of providing health care, but also indirectly uh, in improvements in women's uh, education and status, uh, poverty, uh, amelioration, uh, improved infrastructure, and also the, the presence of, of peacekeepers uh, who allow for uh, security. And then finally, uh, uh, an assumption relating to uh, the possible uh, also positive spillover uh, effects which need to be taken into account in this context uh, relating to, uh, to uh, access to healthcare specifically in uh, refugee camps, uh, where there is already ample evidence that healthcare provision uh, under uh, relatively ordered uh, situations in, uh, in refugee camps uh, is something that may uh, significantly improve uh, the healthcare situation, in, in, even to the extent that uh, populations in camps sometimes have a better uh, healthcare uh, or access to healthcare than what they had uh, in the pre war uh, situation uh, in their location uh, of origin. Uh, and also the increased uh, um, assertiveness to uh, the role that healthcare providers are uh, are playing not only to the refugee populations themselves but also to the local population in the host uh, region which is sometime, uh, sometimes sometimes uh, leading to uh, positive spillover uh, effects the second uh, project uh, was largely triggered by the maternal health project that we uh, that we did based on uh, an observation of the strong, uh, systematic, and seemingly uh, politically unaddressed inequalities identified uh, in the maternal health uh, project. Uh, one, one of our case countries, Nigeria, if you look at, across our, our most recent uh, demographic health survey uh, data, uh, Christian women in the South have typically between eight and nine years of education, and Muslim women in the North have between one and a half and two years. And these are glaring uh, inequalities that also uh, translate into differences in access to healthcare as well as in, uh, in outcomes when it comes to maternal and child uh, mortality. Um, it's also motivated, of course, by the fact that PRIOV for a long time has been involved in research on the causes of armed conflict where horizontal inequalities or intergroup inequalities uh, have been found to uh, very significantly impact the risk of armed conflict onset. So there is a link between uh, focusing and, and addressing systematic inequalities and also building long-term uh, long sort of peaceful uh, relations. 
the uh, Development Aid, Effectiveness and Inequalities in Post-Conflict Societies uh, project, that's a short and snappy title, <laughs> um, is addressing how aid distribution relate to social, political and economic inequalities between individuals and groups, uh, addressing uh, research and policy gaps about the aid inequality nexus. Uh, and we've been focusing specifically uh, on uh, Nigeria, Uganda and Ethiopia. Um, and, and the research questions include both uh, how do uh, different forms of inequality affect the distribution of aid in the first place, meaning whether aid is arriving uh, in areas that are systematically underserviced, and specifically in areas inhabited by uh, politically and socially excluded groups. Uh, and the second research question, which, uh, which uh, we find equally interesting, is of course whether aid is actually contributing to reducing inequalities, uh, and if so, under what conditions, and Syria will be uh, filling us in on some of the results from that uh, project. And both of these projects are uh, evidence-based, uh, uh, focusing on an evidence-based policy using both qualitative uh, field studies, uh, stakeholder analysis, and rigorous quantitative uh, analysis of geographically coded conflict data coming out of the UCDP, uh, the Uppsala uh, Conflict Data Program, uh, as well as uh, geocoded um, health data from the demographic health surveys as well as other individual level surveys. Uh, in this context, it's also interesting to, uh, I also wanted to note that, that um, uh, as an extension project, we also contributed a major report to the World Bank, UN, a new report on uh, Pathways for Peace, uh, which has inequality as one of their um, major uh, focus areas and uh, and one of our contributions was to try to systematic both both review the uh, the empirical evidence for relationships between inequality uh, and armed conflict but also try to measure uh, developments in inequality uh, within countries over time uh, to monitor whether differences are uh, indeed increasing or uh, decreasing both globally and and regionally um and a main point from our side is at least that you know there is data available that allows us to monitor these uh, trends. Uh, though uh, there certainly is a, a lack of interest on, on the part of many governments to try to highlight uh, what are uh, very severe internal uh, differences and perhaps also a, a lack of of uh, of. Uh, focus or interest on part of many uh, international organizations in trying to look at this uh, systematically. Um, and and from at least from our perspective, uh, using this data is allowing us to, uh, to monitor whether what we're doing is providing uh, results that contribute to reduce inequalities, or even uh, in some cases making it worse. Um, we have a, uh, a total of five uh, policy briefs that are available uh, outside the room. Um, emphasizing different uh, findings from these projects uh, that I hope you'll all um, uh, take a look at. They're also, of course, available uh, online from the, uh, the PRIO web, as is, uh, is much of the data that we're uh, using and, and some of the other results, uh, including some of the research papers, which are open access. Um, in terms of the the uh, overview of events uh, f uh, of this event, um, as I mentioned, uh, we'll have um, uh, my two colleagues presenting uh, the work of uh, of uh, on um, our uh, research projects. Gudrun will be will be uh, who's a senior researcher at Prio and, and also director of the Maternal Health uh, Initiative. Will give you some uh, of the highlights of that project and Sigrid. Uh, also, Gusta, uh, who's also a senior researcher at PRIO and director of the Aid and Inequality Project, will provide you with some um, insight from that uh, project. In between the two, uh, we have uh, Aaron uh, Ben David, um, associate professor of medicine at Stanford University, who will be presenting work that we find very interesting and and uh, and comparable and and uh, complementary to our own uh, on um, uh, maternal and child health, and speci specifically infant mortality. Uh, in armed conflict. We have uh, Dr. Kathleen Hill, uh, maternal health lead at USAID's flagship um, maternal and child uh, survival program. We'll be discussing what the ba main barriers are to reaching excluded populations and what the critical knowledge gaps are to providing quality maternal and child care services in conflict areas. And we have uh, Gita Lal, uh, international midwifery specialist for UNFP in Bangladesh. Um, we'll talk about the uh, situation for Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh and how organizations like UNFPA may utilize research. And to lead us off in this uh, important discussion, we're lucky to be in the very capable hands of uh, Megan Parker. Uh, so I'm very happy to leave the floor to you, Megan. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Henrik. It's, it's always great to see you, and congratulations on this incredibly rich research project. And I think you know one of the things that stood out to me is the importance of dis having disaggregated data to be able to find the differential impacts on on men and women, um, but also your ability to knit together. Uh, these uh, different sectors, the different um, approaches between looking at inequality, violence, and health care. So that's uh, incredibly important and, and, and unfortunately rare. Um, I would like to now introduce you to our speakers, uh, give you a little bit um, more information on their background. However, I'm not going to go into great detail because you should have their bios here and you can read all about them uh, at your leisure, uh, and they have much to share with you. So I want to uh, give them uh, as much time as we can uh, to hear directly from them. Uh, after they give their presentations, we'll have a, a Q&A session. So start thinking now about your questions and make sure they're questions, not speeches. Uh, <laughs> it's really important. There are, there are a lot of you here today and a, and a lot of uh, experts, so we'd like to get everybody's question in. And if you're watching online, you can tweet your question to at New Security Beat. Um, so very first uh, to open it up is Gujon Ustbi, who's a senior researcher at PRIO and the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Peace Research, which is one of my favorite journals, and I hope you guys uh, check it out. We've been very uh, pleased to have an uh, ongoing partnership with JPR, uh, where we feature some of their articles for, for our audience. Uh, Gujon? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so good morning, everyone, um, and thanks to the Wilson Center for hosting this event. Um, we are very eager to be here today and share some of our research with you. So uh, I'm going to talk about a main study from our project on armed conflict and maternal health in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, more specifically, I will talk about to what extent local exposure to organized violence impacts the access to maternal health care services in Sub-Saharan Africa. The full uh, research article was published in Demography earlier this year, uh, and it's also summarized in one of the policy briefs that you can find outside. If I can get this to work. Maybe I'm not pointing at the... <laughs> you can just say next okay. slide. And okay. Yeah. So maybe. Yeah. So just Henrik said quite a bit about the motivation behind this uh, project, but I, I thought I should give you a little more motivation for this uh, specific study. So one of the main targets of the Sustainable Development Goals is to reduce the global maternal mortality rate to less than 70 per 100,000 live births by 2030. So there has indeed been some progress uh, over the last year, but the progress is too slow and particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the current global maternal mortality rate is 216 per 100,000 live births, but for sub-Saharan Africa, the corresponding figure is 546. And the odds that a woman in sub-Saharan sub Africa will die from complications related to pregnancy or childbirth during her life is 1 in 36. And this compares to 1 in 3,300 in high-income countries. So the global differences are enormous. So we asked ourselves, why is it that sub-Saharan Africa is lagging so much behind? And uh, we argue that in a region where the majority of countries have experienced armed conflict since the end of the Cold War, this poor performance may indeed be part, uh, in part due to the detrimental effects of armed conflict. And as Henrik mentioned, there has been some evidence at the national aggregate level that there is a correlation between countries that see more armed conflict and that also have higher levels of maternal mortality rate. But we do know that both conflict and health variables vary enormously within countries. Another <laughs> motivation to this discussion is uh, the contested estimates of maternal mortality in conflict and crisis settings. I'm sure many of you uh, read the 
a comment in The Lancet in 2016 by Helena Nordenstedt and the late Hans Rosling, who criticized the UN report for stating that 60% of all maternal deaths take place in humanitarian settings. They found that this percentage was calculated by, based on the total population in the 50 most fragile states in the world, according to some ranking. However, as they argue, not all people in fragile states live in humanitarian settings. And we see the same with conflict. It's very seldom that armed conflict covers the whole territory of a country. Mm -hmm. Let's look at Sub-Saharan Africa in 2016, for example. On this map, you see all the red countries. They are the conflict countries in this year. That means they had at least one lethal conflict event, according to the Uppsala conflict data program, uh, data on armed conflict events. But that doesn't mean that the fighting was going on all over the place. If you see the blue parts on the map, this is where the actual fighting was going on. These are the individual events of lethal armed conflict. And we're talking about three forms of organized violence here. It can be state-based violence, where at least one of the parties is the government of a state. We have non-state conflict, which can be between two rebel groups. And we have non-state violence, which is attacks against civilians. It can be both by the state or by rebel groups. But the main point is that we can't just say that all the people in the red country here live in, in conflict settings. It's actually the people in the blue settings. And if we argue, like we do, that uh, if you live within 50 kilometers or closer of a, a conflict event, you, you live in the conflict setting, then we calculate that about 20% in Sub-Saharan Africa live in a conflict setting. In the world, the corresponding figure is about 12%. It's of course also important to combine these conflict locations with uh, detailed data on uh, population density to see how many people live within these conflict settings. So this is just a, a backdrop. So, as Henrik said, we found quite early when we started to map all the available data from the Demographic and Health Service <coughs> that there are extreme geographical inequalities in maternal health. On the left uh, map, you see all the surveyed villages and towns in Sub-Saharan Africa from the Demographic and Health Service that have been going on since uh, mid-80s until almost up to date. We use in our project data from 1990 to 2014. Um, and here I have mapped the axis of giving birth at a medical health facility. Do you see the darker the color, the higher the share of a woman in this location that have been able to give birth at a hospital uh, or clinic? Uh, it's not so easy to draw generalizations based on the map of the entire Sub-Saharan Africa because these surveys take place at different years in different countries and some countries have more round of DHS uh, surveys than others. So it's more useful to zoom in and look at a specific country. And to the right, you see the map of Nigeria. Uh, Hendrik talked about inequalities in education. We see the same in terms of maternal mortality. You see a much darker color in the um, predominantly Christian South, where it's quite common, actually, to give birth at a hospital. Far fewer women in the Muslim North uh, have the same access to basic maternal health uh, services. Okay. So now we have looked at the data. Then... Um, I'll say a few words about what we did expect about the relationship between uh, local exposure to armed conflict and access to, access to maternal health care services. So conflict is likely to have a negative impact on the access to maternal health care services um, through, uh, in various ways. Um, first, through disturbing population movements. If women are prevented um, or forced to flee um, uh, and can't move around freely in their local community, and this will impede institutional child delivery. Also, uh, armed conflict is also all, uh, often highly disruptive to the economy. An economic decline at the national level may decrease the financial capacity and channel resources away from healthcare. 
Also at the local level, conflict may impede agriculture and interrupt trade, leading to malnutrition and poverty. And because maternal health services are often fee-based in developing countries, these factors combine to reduce the chance of receiving adequate care. And also, of course, it's the destruction of health infrastructure. Uh, hospitals are bombed, medical personnel are killed, and also the destruction of roads make it impossible for women to access the hospital when they're going to give birth. In short, all these explanations lead to the same expectation, uh, which I've written in red here, namely that the more exposed the mother is to organized violence in her home area, the lower the likelihood is that she will give birth in a health facility. Um, but even in areas with an intense conflict level, several socioeconomic factors may determine the resilience of women with respect to surviving pregnancy and childbirth. First, we expect to see um, a more serious effect in rural areas where it's uh, not so uh, many hospitals <laughs> in the first place. In urban areas, women should more easily be able to shift from one supplier to another if armed conflict leads to service disruption. Also, women from wealthier families who are able to purchase access to private health care should be less vulnerable to service disruption due to armed conflict, we expect. And finally, educated mothers are found to have healthier families overall and should also be more likely to both seek and receive adequate care also in times of crisis. So, what do we find? First of all, I think it's um, interesting and useful to say a few words about how we combine these two amazing data sources of the detailed uh, location and timing of conflict events with the detailed subnational information about the use of maternal health care services. So this is just zooming in on a part of Nigeria, and you see the black dots here are the villages or towns where women are interviewed and um, explain uh, their birth history for all the children that are born up to five years before each survey. They report whether they give birth at a hospital or not. And around each village, we draw a circle uh, with a radius of 50 kilometers, and we count all the conflict events that happened six months before the individual birth. So the unit of analysis here is the individual birth, not the mothers, not the respondents of the survey, but their, their kids. And this way, uh, we can really try to isolate the effect of conflict. And this is so important because all the conflict areas are often also very poor areas, and we know that extreme poverty is a very important determinant of um, poor access to maternal health services. So we really want to get at the <laughs> isolated conflict effect. And what we can do with this approach is that uh, we can combine siblings born from the same mother before and after a conflict event took place in the village. And this is what we find. Proximity to recent organized violence events decreased the chances that a child is born at a medical facility by about 1%. Now, this may seem as a very moderate effect, but we're talking a lot of children here. Uh, our back of the envelope calculation based on um, birth figures um, shows that armed conflict in sub-Saharan Africa causes around 47,000 additional children to be born outside health facilities every year. Um, and it's also important to remember that this is likely to be a lower estimate because we do lack information of some of the worst countries, some of the most dangerous countries where they can't even conduct, it's too dangerous to conduct a household survey. So this figure is likely to be much higher. We also find that this negative impact of conflict appears to be stronger <coughs> in urban areas, quite opposite to what we expected. We expected to see a more severe effect in rural areas. Uh, but we do find, as expected, that the negative effect, impact of conflict is more pronounced for poorer mothers and also among less educated mothers. Now, we only look at the very short-term um, effect of conflict, and that has various uh, reasons. First of all, then um, we make sure that there is not the reverse effect. Uh, the women are pregnant, and then the conflict happens, so there is no selection into childbearing. 
also it's less likely that migration uh, disturbs our finding. But when we look at this uh, with more temporal data, we find that there indeed seems to be a sudden drop in the institutional child delivery precisely in the month when a conflict event takes place. And we find that it takes about three years before institutional child delivery reaches pre-conflict levels again. How am I doing on time? Yeah? Getting to this. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Great. <laughs> so um, just a few words about the implications of our findings for both the uh, future research agenda on this important topic and also for policy. First of all, uh, we need to get a better understanding of why organized violence reduces the use of maternal health care services. Is it migration? Is it conflict-related poverty? Is it destroyed infrastructure? Is it a lack of security? Is it a combination of these? We can't really, with the existing data, um, isolate these different explanations. And I think it's also extremely important to get more nuanced data on the quality of services. I've been interviewing women in Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, who have reported that yes, they did indeed give birth at a medical facility, but they also told me that they had to share a bed with seven other mothers. Maybe they had to sleep on the floor. There was no food, no medication, maybe not even medical personnel assisting them when needed. So you can ask, <laughs> one can ask oneself, what does it actually mean to give birth at a health facility if this is what is happening on the ground? And of course, um, from a policy perspective, we really need to understand what works, when, where, and how. The policymakers should invest more in conducting robust future studies, exploring to what extent early external interventions to reach vulnerable populations during conflict may mediate the negative maternal health effects of conflict. And I think I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gujan. One quick uh, clarifying question, or just if you would expand just a little bit more on the on the w on why why you think uh, the effect was uh, worse in urban areas, uh, counter to what you expect to find. This is uh, a finding that we are struggling to explain ourselves. Um, it could be, uh, I, uh, someone suggested to us that it could be that um, women in rural areas are more resilient because they are used to <laughs> uh, less adequate services. I'm not sure if that is a full explanation, but that could be part of the story. But it's really a finding that we are struggling to explain. And I should mention that we have also um, looked at some preliminary data on uh, maternal mortality, where we used information from sisters of each of the respondents. And there we actually find the opposite. There we find that the chance that armed conflict in the vicinity of the respondent leads to a higher chance of maternal mortality of their sisters in the more rural areas. Hmm. So this is a finding that we're actually struggling with. Fascinating. Mm. Great. Thank you again. Uh, now uh, we'll have Dr. Aran Ben David, who is an associate Pre professor of medicine at Stanford and a practicing physician. Aran? Thanks, Megan. Is this on? Yeah. That's great. Um, thanks, everybody. Thanks uh, for uh, coming. Uh, as uh, Megan said, my name is uh, Aran Bin David. I'm an infectious uh, diseases physician at uh, Stanford and um, have uh, entered the world of, of global health initially through the lens of, of infectious diseases, but um, to use my professional language, my interests have uh, gone viral and have warmed <laughs> away uh, into, uh, into further uh, uh, upstream uh, uh, drivers of, of population health. And in that context, um, I've, uh, I've been working more on, uh, on uh, trying to understand issues such as uh, aid effectiveness as well as uh, increasingly the, the role of armed conflict. Um, I'm, uh, I'm uh, really happy to be here with the folks from PRIO. In some ways, I um, it, it's nice to see people with whom you've sort of led parallel lives um, being more <laughs> in, in, uh, in, in the medical world. 
um, in, uh, uh, in the, the folks from Priya more in the, the political science realm. Um, uh, but you know, in many ways, it's very reassuring because you know some of our, even though some of our ways of thinking have been similar, we've done work very independently and have found things that are very concordant. And so um, I'll show you some of the the results that uh, uh, some of the work that we have done. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the hospital for uh, sick children, the branch consortium. Uh, uh, we have some representatives here, Michelle Gaffey and Bob Black, um, and really the Wilson Center for, uh, for, for hosting today. Um, so some of the frame, um, I, I, I uh, don't need to uh, 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 belabor this uh, uh, too much, but you know, when, when people think about uh, conflict uh, in, in northern Nigeria or in, in eastern Congo, um, you know, the direct combatants, the, the people who are uh, directly involved, these are the, the, the images that we usually think of, um, men, um, you know, and, um, and um, uh, direct, uh, you know, the, that are involved in direct um, uh, damages. Um, but the damages really extend far beyond uh, the direct, uh, the direct uh, 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 combatants in, in conflict. Um, I was just talking before this, uh, the meeting this morning with, uh, with Trish from USAID. She was telling about uh, a, a hospital in northern, in northern Mali uh, that, was, uh, uh, that had a, a nurse training program that was destroyed by, uh, by combatants, by terrorists who were uh, operating there at the time. Um, these kinds of, uh, of events are, are common. Um, uh, the, the effects of conflict uh, affect the civilian populations and cause destruction of, of local institutions. Um, and so the, 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 the indirect effects of conflict uh, on the civilian, on the civilian uh, population, on, especially on their health, um, has, been, uh, uh, has been largely understudied, in part because it's very difficult to do that. Um, uh, uh, that said, you know, we, we think of large conflicts, um, and we see these things in television. Um, Conflict is, you know, in, in, in Africa is very common, okay? There have been, uh, you know, over, you know, 24, 25,000 uh, conflict events uh, recorded in, in the database that uh, Henrik and Gudrun were talking about, the Uppsala Conflict Data Program. Um, just to show you the location, it's not just that there have been many of them, but it's, it's, it's very widespread. Uh, you can see, you know, m you know most of, uh, of Africa's, uh, most of the countries in Africa have been, I uh, have witnessed some some conflict events. Um, okay, so so uh, so we wanted to uh, try to get a sense of that. Obviously, if you look at each of these conflicts individually, it's very hard to do that. Uh, so so we looked at uh, at, at the, the 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 overall effect. Um, the other uh, frame that I would like to serve uh, uh, bring to you know bring to serve uh, everybody's attention. You know, Goodrin was talking about the the statement that 60% of maternal deaths happen in conflict countries. Um, uh, in the same statement, uh, it was something along the lines of 50% of child deaths happen in conflict countries. So that's sort of one goalpost that uh, that uh, Hans Rosling was uh, was responding to. The other goalpost is that in if you look at the global burden of disease. Uh, this is uh, this is one one of their sort of um, uh, key maps or key figures that you can uh, see if you look at the global burden of disease. It really tries to characterize and quantify uh, the causes of death and disability around the world. This is in sub-Saharan Africa. These are children. Um, in 2015, the number of deaths. You don't even see conflict here. Conflict is actually the tiny little green dot over to the bottom right. Okay, um, and so that's you know that's about 0.2 percent of all child deaths um, are attributable to conflict, and so that's you know that's sort of the, the other goalpost. These are um, uh, these are direct deaths, and so you know in that sense they're trying to count the, the people who are directly impacted and, and killed by uh, by conflict, uh, but it doesn't take uh, the indirect deaths into uh, into account. Okay, so that's sort of the the other uh, uh, the other goalpost, um, and the truth is probably somewhere in between, and that's what we sort of sought to quantify. Okay, um, I'll go straight to into uh, uh, some of our results, and I'll I'll show you a few of the the the, the couple of the the key findings. Um, so really, what do we see? So the way that we had uh, sort of sliced uh, conflict is we sort of wanted to see um, whether conflicts of greater intensity um, cause uh, greater increase in death. 
Okay. Um, we um, uh, uh, we looked at we, we sort of set that data up in very similar way to uh, to the way that that Goodrun did, and and we looked at I I every child if they if they uh, were exposed if they were if they were born uh, near a conflict within 50 kilometers. Um, what, did, did the risk of dying increase in, uh, in, in that year? Um, and then we looked at different types of conflicts based on how many combatant deaths ha uh, were, you know, were in that conflict. And you can see that the more uh, the blue lines, the more combatant deaths, um, uh, the, the higher the risk of the child dying, the greater the local devastation of, of, um, uh, that, that increased the risk of, of the child not making it to uh, his or her first birthday. Okay, the, the red bar is the average for the entire uh, population, about 7.7% increase in, in overall risk of death. I'll say, I'm not gonna show it here, but I'll say that, uh, that we also see a greater effect in, in cities than, than, uh, than in the rural areas. Um, my, my sort of um, a, a simple understanding of that is that, um, is that co urban conflicts are, are, are more destructive. Um, y you know, they're, they're less diffuse. Uh, than that what you might um, than what you might see in in uh, in, in rural areas. Um, uh, in in terms of the absolute effect, it's about 5.2 deaths per thousand higher uh, than uh, than what you would otherwise expect. Um, the other um, finding that uh, I, I'm, uh, I don't have the, the figure here, but the other finding that is uh, sort of um, important about this is that it, it, it takes about, we also see that it takes about seven or eight years for a conflict to return to baseline. Okay, so in the first year, um, it's about a 7.7% increase. In the second year, um, the year after, um, it's still about 7% higher than what you'd expect. And it starts going down, but it takes about seven or eight years uh, before uh, before you see a return to, to uh, what you would expect um, um, uh, given the, the pre-conflict area. Again, sort of Trisha's story about the, the nursing hospital uh, or the nursing program in the local uh, health facility that got, uh, that got destroyed, again, is, it gives you a, an example of how this happens. Uh, um, you, you know, you, the, the, it's not only, it's not only the, the, uh, the, the, the sort of um, uh, hospital that gets destroyed, but it's, you know, it's the, the, the the training capacity for uh, for health resource for human resources for health in, in the whole area uh, that get uh, that gets destroyed. Okay. Um, uh, in terms of the distribution of, uh, of deaths, um, uh, to give you a sense of, of where, um, again, this you know obviously overlaps the the wh where conflicts are, uh, but you can see that you know that that in uh, in the areas where um, you know things are are uh, familiar in Eastern Congo in northern Uganda, um, you see a lot of deaths, but you also see them very much in sort of very uh, very densely populated areas, and so you know in in Nigeria you see both the north and the south. Are very heavily affected, uh, in part because uh, you know there there are so many children um, that uh, that live in in the southern part. Um, okay, in terms of the number of children uh, that have died, so what we did is uh, is in each of these uh, little areas of, of sub-Saharan Africa, we looked at how many kids are there, um, uh, how many kids are born. Um, and what's what's the 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 the, um, the maternal or sorry what's the infant mortality that we would expect without conflict, um, and then what we actually observe, and so we can take that difference between what we observe uh, and what we would expect absent conflict, um, and and that gap is uh, is how many kids uh, uh, we we can attribute have died. Uh, due to conflict, okay, and so we do that for each of these, for each of these, you know, tiny little pixels. Um, and what we can observe is that the the total number of deaths that that um, the way to sort of read this is to look at this, the sort of the, the second and third uh, columns compared to the first. The total number of deaths that we observe have been 47 million over the period from 1995 to 2015. Um, and what we would uh, expect absent conflict is about three million, three, three, between 3.1 and 3.5 and million uh, deaths fewer. Okay, that's what we would have expected absent conflict. That's for, uh, that's for under one. Uh, for under five, um, it's five, about five million, five to five and a half million deaths uh, that, uh, that would not have occurred um, had there not been conflict, okay? Um, the direct uh, number of deaths from conflict are, uh, have been a little bit under one million. So this represents somewhere between um, uh, three to five times more 
children dying because of conflict than the direct combatants. Okay, so in terms of so the indirect deaths r relative to direct deaths, it, this is this is a lower bound again because we don't take uh, women into account. We don't take um, uh, some of the other uh, the, the effects on vulnerable populations. Uh, but these, uh, but this this uh, this ratio is is much higher. Okay, um, let me. I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to talk just for a moment about uh, about aid. Um, okay, I'll go quickly. Um, <laughs> basically, um, uh, uh, what, what uh, I've been I've been interested in the, uh, in the issue of aid in part because it is uh, it, it is clearly important uh, in addressing these issues. Areas of conflict, as Paul Collier says, is development in reverse. Um, it, it, these are areas where uh, local institutions have a hard time reaching. Um, uh, aid potentially has a, a role to play. Um, I'll just say briefly that aid has uh, really increased a lot since about 2000. Okay, this is you know the only point really that that uh, I'll make out of this figure um, uh, that aid towards the health sector, including a, a lot towards child health and maternal mortality, or and maternal health. And here's the last figure that I want to show. Um, and what what this figure shows in each um, you can see that in each year there are sort of three columns of dots. Each column represents the poorest to the left, the middle population and the wealthiest population in each country okay and so um, and so what you see is uh, what you see are is uh, is a bunch of countries and for each one we know the, the mortality rate for children uh, for the poorest for the middle and for the wealthiest and these the three lines represent sort of the median tendency for each of these and so the red line is for the poorest the orange line is for the middle the, the maroon is for the wealthiest in each country and my point, the main point that I want to show here is what have what has happened to mortality in terms of over the the, the economic spec, the, the the social economic spectrum in each country, um, and you can see that it has um, really converged. Okay, from uh, from really very wide estimates over um, in the 90s um, uh, over to a much narrower gap uh, over uh, by um, by by the, the by 2010, um, and in fact the the biggest uh, sort of narrowing of that gap has happened uh, after the year 2000. And so I can't attribute that directly to aid. I'm excited to see Siri's uh, uh, talk, um, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, something that has been sort of uh, interesting is this, is that this convergence um, has happened, uh, um, you know, sort of that, such that the poor, the, the mortality rate among the poorest um, uh, has really gone down very fast. Um, relative to the, the wealthy. Um, it, it has accelerated since the year 2000. I think some of that has to do with aid. I'll say that the countries, we have, when we looked at this, the countries where it hasn't happened are very conflict-affected countries. Um, and, so, um, uh, and so, you know, this has been sort of a, a unique um, uh, sort of hint about, about uh, what's, what's preventing this convergence, uh, the equities from, from being achieved. Um, with that, I'll end. Um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll m again emphasize the point that that uh, conflict-affected regions uh, really are are becoming uh, sort of the, the areas where that that require increasing emphasis uh, in order to achieve uh, the sustainable development goals and and our uh, our broad shared goals uh, for child mortality and for maternal mortality. Uh, and I'll turn it over to to. Theory. Maybe Megan, if you want to intervene <laughs> in the middle. Thank you very much, John. That's a great segue. That's a great segue into Siri's presentation. Uh, Siri Rusta is the senior researcher at PRIO, where she heads the research project Development Aid Effectiveness and in Inequalities in Conflict Affected Societies. Siri? Well, thanks. That was. Uh, a perfect uh, way of uh, turning over to my presentation. So I'll be talking more about uh, the effectiveness of aid on infant mortality. So you should think we've been collaborating, but we haven't. <laughs> I promise. <It's> true. <laughs> so I'll be talking about two studies that we have been doing uh, related to the uh, to our project on aid, and the first is on. Uh, infant mortality, and the other one is on inequality. So we know that uh, there will be... Sp what? I didn't do anything. <laughs> 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 so there will be spent uh, 2.5 trillion US dollars on uh, aid uh, between 2015 and 2030, which is a lot of money. And there has been uh, a lot of criticism towards the aid... Um, agencies about how, whether this 
money will be spent efficiently, uh, effective or not. So there are some research showing that do not find any effect. Um, some studies find uh, some effect um, of aid. Um, a lot of this can, can be contributed or have been claimed to be contributed to the fact that uh, aid follows success rather than creating it. So instead of creating positive health outcomes, aid goes to the areas where there already is uh, a positive development. Uh, the problem with a lot of these studies, as has been underscored several times now, is that these are country level studies. So they are comparing um, a lot of countries which are very different um, with each other, and sometimes they do not take into account these differences. Uh, and also the effect of aid is, uh, aid is probably local, so we need to uh, measure the local effects and not the aggregated national effect uh, on, for example, infant mortality. Um, so it's, um, so uh, as you might see, Nigeria is one of our favorite countries. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that Nigeria has very good data on health outcomes uh, due to these uh, demographic and health surveys. Um, and again, these maps uh, show to the, um, to the left, shows the infant mortality. And again, we can, the darker color, the higher uh, infant mortality. And we can again see that there is a big difference between the north and the south. Uh, like uh, Henrik was uh, underscoring education and Gudrun was mentioning with uh, maternal mortality. Uh, on the right side, we see dots where we have aid projects. Uh, and when you compare these countries, you see that there is a lot of uh, infant mortality or high rates of infant mortality in the northeast, but very few aid projects in that region. Uh, the aid uh, data that we use is from a project called Aid Data, which is financed by, the, uh, by USAID and uh, coded in Maryland, uh, no, um, Williamsburg. Uh, and they code so uh, the location, the specific location for each aid project. Uh, and we can utilize this uh, in the same way as uh, Gudrun and Iran has already described. So what we do is that we take each of these aid uh, project locations and we draw a circle around them, 50 kilometers, uh, and then we look at the uh, levels of um, infant mortality within that uh, area. And since we know when the projects were established, we can also then compare uh, levels of infant mortality from before a project to after a project was the introduced. Um, and we also do, uh, similar to what Gudrun talked about, we, do not com we compare siblings. So children born by the same mother before and after a project was introduced to see whether uh, a, ch a child has a higher likelihood of surviving. So what do we find? Well, it seems that aid actually saves lives. Um, we find that... <laughs> Children born by um, mothers who live close to uh, aid projects are less likely to die within the first 12 months than mothers, than children do, that do not live close to aid projects. Uh, and in fact, we find that uh, aid reduces uh, infant mortality by 10 children per 1,000 children. So that means uh, in Nigeria, for example, where the infant mortality rate on the sample that we use is 92 children per thousand, means that it reduces infant mortality rate with 11%, which is quite substantial. Uh, further, we also find that in the regions that we, uh, in the areas that we are able to investigate, it seems that infant mortality rate goes more than for marginalized groups. So for example, uh, Muslim uh, women in the north, children uh, or in rural areas, so th this is an indication that aid is also helping to close this uh, inequality that we have seen on the map several times. Now, of course, there's a catch with this. So what we do find is that aid does not, do not go to the area where it's needed the most. So do not go to the, it goes to the areas where you already have uh, 
higher or lower infant mortality rate. Um, the way we have set up our study is that we cannot test that because we need to have the project to, to draw this buffer. So we cannot say uh, for sure that it's actually reaching or helping marginalized groups um, more than others. Um, and that's the, the second study we uh, look at here. Um, so we want to know whether uh, aid is allocated to the same degree to excluded groups as inclu or included group, politically excluded and politically included groups. Um, aid has the potential to uh, reduce the intergroup uh, inequalities um, by uh, allocating more aid to excluded areas. On the other hand, it can also exacerbate these inequalities by not uh, taking them into account when all allocating aid. Um, as I said, uh, in our study we find that in Nigeria aid is more often allocated to uh, areas with less infant mortality. Other studies also find that aid is allocated to more wealthier areas. So the poorest areas do not get aid. Uh, another strain of the literature uh, has shown that aid is allocated to the president's home region or to the region of the president's ethnic kind. Um, also, we see that uh, aid more often go to areas where there's already infrastructure. So it's easier to allocate where there are roads, uh, where you have hospitals. Um, one of the predictors for aid, best predictors for aid allocation is previous aid. So this suggests that uh, aid is uh, ca or can be politically manipulated uh, in the way it's distributed. So we wanted to test this. Um, and we also know that uh, a lot of the donors focuses on this. So this quote is from the World Bank, um, where they, they state that they want to reduce the within um, within country inequalities. So you would think that um, they then allocate more aid to regions with marginalized groups. That would sort of be the logical result from that uh, statement. Uh, so these are uh, maps of distribution of aid. And we're in this case just looking at World, uh, World Bank aid project and areas with uh, politically exclu excluded groups and politically included groups. So this is, um, uh, we do not use buffers in this case, we use uh, fishnets, so we put on top of, of Africa. Uh, and then we see whether each specific grid cell uh, includes an aid project in the period between 1996 and 2013. Uh, and we do the same with uh, excluded and included groups. So what we find is that areas with excluded <coughs> groups have a 35% less chance of getting a World Bank project than areas with included groups. Um, and since we're in this uh, test looking at the time period from 1996 until 2013, we thought that, well, this debate has evolved. So we look at a shorter time period from 2006 to 2013, and the effect is actually stronger uh, it's 48% less chance to get an aid project for excluded groups than included groups. Um, now, there could be several reasons for this, of course, um, but our conclusion is that uh, there needs to be a more critical assessment of where aid is distributed. Um, further, of course, our study only is a very a uh, descriptive study of where aid is allocated. We do not look at why this is happening, and we do not look at uh, how this affects the actual intergroup inequalities. So that would be a next step on that research agenda. Thank you very much, Siri.
I'm glad that we can say that aid does save lives. That's really good. <laughs> it is a really positive thing to say. Um, but interesting to hear about uh, the persistence of, of aid in previous areas, and I think something we can come back to in the Q&A. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Kathleen Hill, who is the maternal health lead for USAID's flagship maternal and child survival program, and also a family physician. Kathleen? Thank you very much, and many thanks to the Wilson Center and to Prio for including me in this. Um, really happy to be a part of this discussion, and personally very interesting to look at the ways in which conflict intersects with so many of the contributors to access and quality that we think about all the time for those of us that work in the MCH sphere. So it's really a wonderful opportunity to have the chance to broaden our horizons a bit and look at the complexities. So, um, I was asked to speak about inter what we know about interventions to read excluded populations with MCH services in humanitarian settings. And unfortunately, you know, based on a review of the literature, and there have actually been um, three uh, uh, systematic reviews that have been published this year, and I'll be speaking mostly about maternal health and sexual and reproductive health. We really have very limited evidence on interventions that increase utilization of access to maternal and sexual and reproductive health services in crisis settings, as well as even less evidence on interventions that increase utilization of services among particularly vulnerable groups, you know, the socially and politically excluded. And this wasn't surprising to me. I mean, for those of us, I think in both conflict and non-conflict settings, many of us who work in this area know the challenges that we have, particularly around understanding, A, who are these most excluded groups in terms of burden of, you know, uh, poor health outcomes, access quality, um, that's a constant struggle for us to understand these inequities. Um, there are some promising interventions based on this latest review, which was actually just published two months ago, um, showing that particularly around increasing utilization of MCH high-impact services in um, crisis settings, and this was both conflict and non-conflict, so humanitarian in general, that interpersonal and peer-led education and mass media campaigns can play a role, and not surprisingly, that community-based programming and task shifting, for example, training lower cadre refugee or, international or internally displaced persons can have an impact. However, many of the studies that showed this were looking at outcomes related to utilization of services and not maternal health outcomes, which, you know, is very hard to track anyway in a, whether a conflict or a non-conflict, very difficult to get real-time data. But I would say after looking at these systematic reviews that interventions that increase access and have an effect on health outcomes for women, maternal health, are really unsurprisingly not available. And that's why it was so interesting to hear about the child health, because I think, you know, unfortunately, we have overall higher rates of infant and child mortality, so it's easier to track outcome measures than it is in maternal health, which is, you know, no reason that we shouldn't absolutely be focused on all of maternal newborn health. Um, I, I really like the point that's been coming out that I think Gudrun was making about the importance of local data and that we can't just extrapolate that, you know, all fragile settings, you know, affect all people um, in the same way. And I think that this really resonated with me because it's something that we're increasingly focused on in conflict and non-conflict settings in programming for maternal and newborn and child health. And, you know, one of the challenges that we face um, from the point of view of designing and implementing and monitoring the effectiveness of programs in conflict and non-conflict settings is that local MCH data on coverage and especially quality of MCH services is really weak. You know, and there are many reasons for this. You know, often health management information systems, as many of us know, do not include many MCH data elements 
related to provision of high impact interventions, but also related to mortality. The, prog the program that I work with, the USAID Maternal Child Survival Program, has done a review of the MNH data element content in health management information systems in 24 countries, including Nigeria, including Afghanistan, USAID priority MCH countries, and health outcomes, even at the institutional level, at, in facilities, for example, related to maternal mortality, infant mortality, are actually not present in a significant percent of routine health information systems, and even data around cause of death. So, you know, when we're looking at how in, in conflict settings, you know, how to have information about both sort of the key contributors to poor health outcomes, but also just having local data to guide you know, programming on the ground in real time that can be used by frontline providers, NGOs that are supporting them, and government. We really are information poor. Um, the other um, uh, issue is that within, you know, fragile states and non-fragile and conflict and non-conflict, often health managers and health workers have very limited you know, skills, background experience in actually using, collecting, interpreting local data. Um, so the even if we do have the, the local information, which we still have a long way to go, there's an enormous need to build, um, you know, capacity among, you know, frontline health managers, Ministry of Health. And I wasn't surprised it was interesting when Hendrik was speaking about that sometimes we see healthcare quality and outcomes may improve in like, you know, you know, high intensity crisis settings where, you know, refugee camps, because in a sense, you're just somersaulting some of the issues. And I remember this when I was living in northern Nigeria and looking at some of the humanitarian and sort of their information systems and then what the regular government services were dealing with. It was just apple and apples and oranges. Um, <clears throat> And then I think I just want to reemphasize again the point that was made, which is, is that local data on access and quality of services and health comes for the most vulnerable, the socially and politically displaced, is I think really sort of the next huge priority for us all working in MCH. Because we recognize that, you know, there are huge inequities within countries coming back to this local data, and yet we are really struggling with how to even understand the depth of some of those inequities, more, uh, and even less how to actually monitor data in real time to help us know, are we reaching these excluded populations? Are we having making a difference for them. And I think, you know, in high resource settings, we see that there's an enormous focus now on addressing disparities in health outcomes, access to care, quality of care. I mean, in this country now for maternal health, huge focus on the disparities around, you know, the results of um, the, the unproportionate burden of maternal mortality and morbidity among African American women. I was speaking with Hendrik briefly before we started, and I think you know the point that there may be political disincentives, particularly in conflict areas, that um, you know really create intentional barriers to the you know transparent collection of data related to excluded populations. I can only imagine you know how significant that must be. Um, and I think it's interesting to think about what can the role of aid be. Thank you. I will speed up. So this is just a picture from Afghanistan, sort of talking, you know, kind of to highlight local frontline midwives using data. I'm just going to say a few words about Afghanistan, where um, USAID funds, you know, and has funded for many years, um, you know, um, very large health uh, product. Uh, projects as, as well as, of course, you know, in, you know, way beyond just health. Um, but this is this is a, a map of Afghanistan, and um, Japaigo is implementing a large program with USAID funding in Afghanistan, and this shows the areas of greatest conflict in Afghanistan. Um, this uh, is the maternal mortality rate at the population level in Afghanistan based on the, on the 2015 DHS. And I think for those of us who work in maternal health, it's just absolutely, astoundingly horrible. <laughs> um, and you can see you know, some of the issues around access and quality. 
We, uh, the, the program funded by USAID that was led by Jepaigo did a quality of care assessment throughout Afghanistan in conflict and non-conflict in the sort of highest conflict areas. Because of time, I don't have time to go into the details, but there's a lot that we can learn and I just wanted to share just a little snapshot. One is that 60% of facilities had a skilled birth attendant on call 24 hours a day. And we know that, you know, presence of health workers is an issue in many settings, absenteeism. I've certainly seen it in northern Nigeria where I worked. But we also know, and I'll show you some quotes, that this is directly related to conflict in many settings, the sort of indirect, you know, non-battle causes of mortality for women and children in conflict areas. And then um, also coming back in the third bullet to the, to the point that we were making earlier, less than 60% of facilities in these highest conflict settings, as well as many non-highest conflict are not tracking basic data on mortality outcomes, even at the facility level, much less having any idea what's happening at the population level. I wanted to just share a few um, quotes from midwives as part of this quality of care assessment. Um, <coughs> we assessed over 250 50 facilities and included qualitative assessments with midwives. And I think this really highlights, in midwives' words, <coughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Sure. Let me let me read this out to you. Insecurity, <laughs> insecurity is a major challenge. The Taliban has closed the door of the hospital <coughs> and does not let any patient visit, except for obstetric patients. There are no male staff at night. Only a midwife stays alone <coughs> in the world. We are scared. Mm. Sure, sure, sure. Can I? <laughs> Sorry, I'm tired of swiveling my head. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gita. For friends would need to practice <laughs> <laughs> uh, security is very bad. When we come to work, we don't believe that we are <coughs> home safe. Thank you very much. And there's one more. <laughs> <laughs> the Taliban has the contact number of all nurses and midwives, and who will decide who will go to work and who will stay at home. Armed people enter inside the facility, abuse the head of the hospital, and threaten the midwives and nurses <coughs> in the wards. Thank you so much. I apologize. I've had this cold and thought that it would be over, but clearly it's, it's raising its head, so my apologies. Well, thank you. I think I'll end there. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen, especially for, for pushing through. I, I know you've been under the weather, and we really appreciate you, you coming and participating. Um, and uh, I really appreciate your emphasis on, on the importance of data, <coughs> local data and the challenges, of course, on the limits of that data, particularly data in conflict settings. Um, and I think that's something we'll continue to, to discuss in the Q&A. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Gita, and thank you, Gita, for, for already jumping in. <coughs> Um, Gita Lal is the Senior Technical Advisor for Strategic Partnerships Human Resources for Health at UNFPA, as well as the Global Midwifery Program Coordinator. And uh, uh, we'd also like to thank UNFPA uh, for its support and partnership of our Maternal Health Initiative and welcome Gita back to the center once again. Thank you so much. With kind permission, I'd like to stand again. It's just a little bit tough. Uh, um, I'm going to be talking about maternal and newborn health and really seeing how aid plays out in practice, taking an example of Bangladesh. But before I start, I do want to acknowledge our country office in Bangladesh. I hope some of you are watching there uh, for their immense hard work, you know, for standing out in this, in this crisis. Uh, we tend to underestimate the amount of work and effort that goes into it. I also want to thank Rondi Anderson for his support in putting this presentation together because I needed the data from the ground. So humanitarian emergencies, I think it's been alluded to. Uh, you know, there's, there's certain things which really tend to get overlooked apart from food, shelter, um, uh, you know, for, for food, shelter, clothing. Um, the sexual and reproductive health needs, the maternal health needs that women get pregnant in emergencies, all that tends to get overlooked. And the special vulner vulnerabilities that women face, particularly sexual violence, rape, HIV, and uh, you know, the life-threatening complications that a pregnant woman can, uh, you know, can, can have, and lack of access to family planning, unwanted pregnancies, the hygiene needs of women. These are some of the things that get critically overlooked. 
So Bangladesh is one of the classic examples of humanitarian emergencies. There's no year that passes where they don't have some kind of critical emergency. Floods, cyclones, floods, landslides, drought, earthquakes, and now uh, a more complex emergency, that's going to be my focus. But floods, uh, if you see, are the most common and why have the widest impact. It's, uh, Bangladesh is quite low lying, you know, below the sea level. And they, they, they experience unprecedented floods every year. So in 2017 alone, about 7 million people were affected. Uh, in the five divisions of 31 uh, districts, 31 of the 64 districts. And what UNFPA does is it, uh, and I'll get into that a little bit more, uh, we provide reproductive health supplies, dignity kits, midwives, and also support the health facilities. The Rohingya crisis in Bangladesh. I think it's been in the papers. Most of you are aware of what's happening. And uh, let me tell you for those, uh, just, to, just a very, very quick recap. The Rohingyas are amongst the most prosecuted, persecuted minorities in the world, and the largest Muslim minority in Myanmar. And they're mostly in the Rakhine state in Myanmar. The, and they were denied citizenship under, under a, a 1982 Myanmar nationality law. So they are amongst the eight minority communities in Myanmar, but they are kind of stateless, so the, because the state does not recognize them. So if the state does not recognize you, how can you even have projects in Myanmar? So, and they've been you know, very widely persecuted, and it's been going on for ages. So it's, a, it's been a huge crisis right from 1978. They're persecuted, stateless, subjected to ethnic cleansing, restricted movements, even limitations on the kinds of livelihoods that they can practice. And fleeing Myanmar, what, is, what was formerly Burma, at a very, very staggering rate. So this, actually, I found this map quite interesting. And uh, this is uh, this is an Arakan project map from October 2017. What is interesting to note is this is, uh, the pointer doesn't work, but this is where, in the Rakhine say, that's where the, the uh, you know, the, the Rohingyas are, and Cox's Bazar, this state, uh, you know, is, is where they are fleeing to because Bangladesh is right adjoining. But there are also Rohingyas in India, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, as far as Indonesia and Malaysia and Thailand. So they have scattered. Now, who are the ones who are going here and who are the ones who are coming here? Or they are then migrating to all these other places. This is now, uh, this is a snapshot of Cox's Bazaar, where bulk of the migration has happened. So there is approximately 1.3 million affected population, both host and refugees. I think that point also came up, uh, you know, because the host population gets hugely impacted. They're, as it is very poor, they're, as it is suffering, and then you have this vast influx of refugees who come in, and you know, they, they impose further stress on the resources. About 700,000 cumulative new arrivals since August 2017. Okay, and this is slightly older figures. Some estimates say as many as 900,000 that I've read. So this is just in this area. And roughly half of them are women and girls, and they are concentrated in this blue area that you see on top. And 66% per, of them have no vehicular access. So it's been a protracted crisis. So what has UNFPA done? Because I'm going to talk specifically about what you know, UNFPA is one of the key development aid agencies is doing there. So sec in between 1990s to 2015, sexual reproductive health care got integrated into two primary health care centers in two camps. If I go back to the previous slide, these two orange ones, were th they are the longer registered camps. And all these new camps have emerged after the crisis, after the recent crisis. Between 15, uh, from 2015, there were another 80,000 arrivals. This is just up to last year. And then we introduced nine surrounding government facilities and increased the other support that I was talking about. August 2015, which I just mentioned, a massive influx, which continues on a daily basis, of which there's no record also. And everything has been upscaled in the past one year. 42 health facilities, overall 202 midwives are working in refugee camps. About half of them, 127, are supported by UNFP alone. There was a talk about development aid, that it's possibly not reaching the marginalized. Sorry, I'm starting getting breathless now. Um, 
I want to make a point here. <laughs> there is a difference between earmarked aid and unearmarked aid. The unearmarked aid that, uh, that comes to countries on a bilateral basis or through the World Bank as soft loans, it can typically be used by countries on, you know, based on a project proposal. So they have, the countries, the governments have more power <coughs> to use it as they wish. This earmarked uh, aid, which many of the UN agents, many of the donors have been increasingly uh, giving. For instance, UNFPA, our, our regular resources, which is unearmarked aid, used to be far higher about you know, three, four years ago. It used to be like 60 and 40 was unearmarked. Today, the situation is reversed. Our unearmarked aid is, uh, our earmarked aid is higher are the other resources that we are getting for specific projects. So if aid comes for a project like this, then it goes there, <coughs> because we have to report and there are monitoring mechanisms. Very quickly, uh, this is what we do. So we are looking at deployment of midwives, we are looking at health camps, mobile clinics, reproductive health kits, which can, uh, contain medical supplies, family planning supplies, rape kits, <coughs> You know, these are our reproductive health kits. They could be simple clean delivery kits or, you know, with just a, a thread to tie the umbilical cord, a sheet, gloves, you know, a, a blade and a, a, a pack of soap to uh, obstetric kits which can serve about 50,000 population and weigh, weigh over a ton. That contains everything. You know, they, they can be used for referral facilities. It has everything that you need, including blood transfusion. And then we have what is called Dignity Kits. Uh, dignity Kits is something that we started around the time of the tsunami. And Dignity Kits is something that is totally overlooked. Like when these refugees are coming, they have absolutely nothing on their backs. So it contains a bar of soap, it contains a sarong, it contains a towel, you know, something very basic, sanitary towels. And that's what a Dignity kits, Kit is. And uh, in Bangladesh, I'll show you a picture. Psychosocial support. Now, UNFP has become the lead agency on psychosocial support and gender-based violence. How can we have aid projects in areas where there's open conflict? Who's going to set them up? In South Sudan, people are hacking each other up. How can you possibly have uh, aid projects or health clinics uh, being set up there? So they're mostly in camps. They're mostly where there has to be some semblance of uh, security, you know? And even, believe me, the people who are working there, the midwives who are working there, they're risking their lives every single day. So that's, that's about cycles. Women-friendly spaces. Again, this is huge. This is really huge, that uh, safe place where women can come, the, you know, it, it, it's psychosocial support they get, they get other women to talk to. Again, something very important, and there we also provide them with family planning and, you know, basic, the, the behavior change uh, possibly is being introduced through these women-friendly spaces where you talk about family planning and tell them it's important to go for antenatal care, etc. I'm just going to go fast. This is where our projects are located. These are the refugee camps. You can see uh, this. Uh, I think you're going to preserve this uh, presentation. But this is where our projects are located, the women-friendly spaces, the SRH clinics, um, and the, uh, you know, where we are supporting the government facilities. Maternal health. Over 300,000 women of reproductive age. There's a new study which I've just received last night. It's called the Ramos study, Reproductive Age Mortality Study, which has just been finalized about two days ago. And though it's not in my presentation, since there was a lot of talk about data, I do want to mention it. It's trying to, we are trying to collect, together with CDC and others, um, uh, you know, baseline data on what are the causes of maternal deaths to count the number of women coming and um, really to translate uh, to, to translate evidence into action. So that is going to go on, uh, that's already started. Uh, and uh, th about 30,000 women are estimated to be pregnant. That figure seems very high, but it includes both host and refugee population. About 8,000 live births expected in the next three months, and about 1,200 women may experience obstetric complications. So now the development and humanitarian nexus. 
you, uh, you see, UNFP started a global midwif, you know, as part of our global midwifery program. We launched it in Bangladesh in about 2010, and as a result of this program, we now have a lot of diploma cadre midwives, 1,884 graduates who are waiting for employment. So it came in our favor because we could quickly deploy them to this emergency, because the government had bound itself to deploy these midwives, and they were there, they were ready. However, there are also problems. So th this is just overall. 23, we have health facilities that are being supported just in Cox's Bazar and 19 women-friendly uh, centers, 127 midwives. And I'm not going to go through these figures, uh, but it shows that th a lot of work is happening um, around SRH and antenatal care, etc. This, this is an example of the dignity kit that you can see. Uh, <coughs> These are some of the reproductive health kits, you know, from, uh, uh, you know, that can serve 10,000 persons to 30,000 to 150,000 for referral levels, primary health care, et cetera. <clears throat> I just want to sh briefly talk about the major challenges. One is the sheer magnitude of the problem. You know, if you have hundreds of thousands of refugees coming and bombarding, uh, and you know, uh, just totally unaccounted and already fragile in in an already fragile state, it becomes it becomes huge. Then the terrain, the chaos. Uh, I ask my colleagues, what do you think when you when you go there? It's it's just utter chaos. You know, just managing. Imagine if another, uh, say say 200 Americans were to descend here, you would not know what to do. I'm talking about America or any other place, uh, you know, just out of nowhere. Then maintaining the basic quality of SRH services. Now these midwives that we have deployed are fresh midwives. They need mentoring, they need support, they need clinical skills. Some of them don't have such good clinical skills, so UNFP has started addressing that through the referral hospitals, which they have to attend to improve the quality of the care that they're providing. So we are looking at those. Of course, we also get stretched about you know, how much we can do also because of our own staffing and other constraints. Then I've talked about the capacities. Also, it takes a long time to bring behavior change. Why do we forget that? People, these communities, these refugees, and it applies to sub-Saharan Africa also, they don't believe in family planning. Some of them are pronatalist societies. They've lost a lot of men. I think what you mentioned about a lot of men having been, or the male mortality rate being high. If they've lost so many men, they believe that if they have a large number of children, the, the chances of survival would be a little bit better. So they tend to, be, tend to have more kids, and this change is very difficult to bring about. And then the gaps in health assessments and the data, which the UN has looked into together with CDC and the Bangladesh Ministry of Health, the RAMOS, which is now being implemented. And the last but not least, uh, successes. What we have seen is that if your system is already strong, if you can strengthen your health system per se, then you are better situated to attend to an to a emergency. Emergency falls from the air. You know, when the complex emergency, is, there's really no precedent. You know, if people are killing each other, I mean, what can you do? At seven, eight times, I would say people have gone back to the Stone Age in some countries. Afghanistan in 2001 and two was looked like a Stone Age uh, country. There were, uh, Anyway, whoever's had the pleasure of being there at that time would know what I'm saying. 24-7 uh, emergency response is extremely difficult for us to maintain. And last but again not least, disaster prepare preparedness, coordination of efforts by stakeholders are absolutely key. This is uh, my last message. Thank you from all of us and the country office in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gita, and uh, this, is, uh, this has been an incredibly insightful presentation from all of our speakers, and now it is time to hear from you. My colleagues have uh, microphones. Um, please uh, wait for the microphone, and uh, please state your name and affiliation before asking your question, and, and please make sure it is a question. And I'm going to take a couple at once so we give our panelists the time to catch their breath and, and reflect on them. Let's start with uh, back here in the back, Olivia. Uh, I'm in the black shirt. Hi, my name is Naoko Kozuki. I'm a health researcher for the IRC. Uh, I have a question for Iran about the definitional question about what attributable to conflict means. So it seemed clear that it was beyond uh, 
just the direct conflict effect but it would be great if you can define and then also to Kathleen uh, you know with with data generation there's kind of the obvious issues of security and capacity but um, you know, as an NGO worker, I think NGOs have a role to play in, uh, in data generation. And I think one of the issues is length of funding. And that, uh, you know, I think IRC funding, like the median, le median length is like 12 to 15 months. And it's, I think, unreasonable to expect that a robust data system can be developed in that time. So if you have any thoughts on that, uh, that'd be appreciated. Let's take one uh, more over here from Diana in the yellow. I'm Deirdre Le Pen. I'm a Sorry. consultant in um, public health and also uh, African studies. I've done quite a lot of work in Africa and Nigeria, particularly. Um, I wonder if you would respond to this observation that inequality is not evenly distributed, even in marginalized societies, and particularly in families that are in polygamous areas. Uh, younger mothers and their children are definitely more vulnerable than other members of the family. And my question is, do you have any thoughts on how aid can be targeted to this population and how uh, services can meet their particular needs? And one more right here, and then we'll give the panel a chance. Thank you guys so much. That was, I think, one of the most brilliant panel sessions I've attended in a very long time. My name is Smita Kumar. I'm in the Global Health Bureau in the Maternal Child Health Nutrition Office. I have two questions. One, um, when you talked about uh, child mortality, you talked about the under five and the infant mortality. I'm curious if you have any line of sight on the neonatal and postneonatal, and you know what are your kind of thoughts on that? And the second, um, We've been talking a lot about health system resilience, I think globally, uh, recently, especially after post Ebola. So using the operational definition of, you know, uh, health system resilience being effectively responding to crisis, maintaining core functions, and then having a kind of autopsy type function in your system built in to kind of review how you address an emergency. What are your thoughts on in this particular area, what should countries and especially donors be looking to support in addition to, as you said, building a strong primary health care system, addressing the building blocks, but what might we be doing differently specifically to look at the resilience aspects using that operational definition? Let's start with uh, Aaron, Aaron if you want to answer the question about conflict. Sure. Uh, uh, so, you know, so briefly, uh, a couple of things. One is on the attribution. So, you know, the, the way that my, as well as Gudrun and Siri studies set up is, is uh, you're looking at the, the um, you're looking at the mortality rate in an area and then there is a conflict and it goes up. Okay. Um, and it goes up, you know, by a particular amount and then it sort of takes a while to sort of come back down. It's this increase that we had say is, you know, is attributable to conflict after you sort of take a account of as much as you possibly can otherwise. Um, and so, you know, that, that, that's the, that's the uh, um, attribution. It's not, it's not the kids who are obviously in the line of fire. Um, it's um, it's the, the increase that you see that, that, can, that really seems to be related to the conflict. Um, just a, a couple of quick other things, you know, on the question of neonatal, we, ha we have looked at neonatal. We looked at, uh, um, at, at the, the conflict that um, the, um, uh, the mom was exposed to during her pregnancy, and so what happens to the baby in their first month of life. Um, and there is, you know, there is a large increase. It's about, you know, half of what we see for the entire first year. Um, uh, and so, the, in in terms of the magnitude, but there's the, there's a substantial effect there. And in terms of, of targeting particular interventions um, for reducing inequalities, I think a lot of it has to do with what are the the almost like what are the mechanisms that are involved in in you know in these mortality. And I think you know a lot of the reason why you see um, uh, uh, sort of um, at least the convergence on the on the uh, wealth uh, gradient is that 
you're, uh, you, a lot of the, the uh, diseases that were really concentrated among the poorest, along the vaccine uh, attributable uh, diseases or vaccine preventable diseases, malaria, um, a lot of these were uh, part of the interventions that were uh, really uh, sort of distributed in, in these countries and have contributed to, uh, uh, to the, at least that convergence of, of inequalities. Um, others uh, uh, can be, but it, you know, it does take a little bit more understanding of what are the, the, the conditions that are really concentrated among the marginalized population. Kathleen, would you like to answer the question about length of funding and then any other? Uh, sure, and apologies for my coffee outbreak and uh, my infectious disease colleague can <laughs> <laughs> vouch that I don't, I really don't think I'm infectious anymore. This is two and a half weeks. I've had a chest x-ray, but that just, I think it just, <laughs> the coughing triggered it. So just in case you're all sitting here thinking, oh no. <laughs> um, I think it's a really good question about uh, your question about what's the role of NGOs in terms of generating data. And certainly in a country like Afghanistan where almost all of the health services are contracted to NGOs. Um, I, you know, I do think that NGOs generate an enormous amount of data, like even the quality of care assessment and end lines, et cetera. But I guess coming back to this question of health system resilience and the nexus between you know, crisis and, you know, development assistance. I think that, um, at least from my perspective, you know, there's an enormous need to invest in information systems that are sustainable, that are ultimately led and used by local actors. And I'm not saying that in crisis situations there's not, you know, I mean, we do need to set up parallel systems sometimes, and I'd be interested to, to hear um, your thoughts on this, but I do think we have to constantly sort of handle this tension. And then your point that NGOs, you know, often projects are funded for very brief periods, so mm -hmm. I, that's maybe another argument to, you know, think very carefully about what you know, what data should and shouldn't be generated within the context of individual projects. I don't know if you want to. Sure, I think I can add two, uh, uh, two questions. Uh, one was about uh, the, that inequality is not evenly distributed and about the younger mothers being more vulnerable. <laughs> the question that you posed. Um, we have specific programs on adolescent sexual and reproductive health, which also Jipaigo and MCSP are, are targeting. In fact, we also started programs on first-time young mothers, really to improve, you know, uh, uh, care-seeking behaviors, you know, because especially the first time that you're pregnant, so you target that group, so that even in subsequent pregnancies, they start visiting our health facilities. Um, so really youth-friendly services looking at, you know, um, a lot of programs on child marriage, there's, there's stunts going on in that sphere. Um, on, on the health system uh, resilience, um, again, you know, what you, you were talking about SDGs, Henrik, in the, in the beginning. Um, um, we, we, we do have the goal of reaching the most marginalized first now, you know, because if you're talking about eliminating maternal mortality and eliminating child mortality, that means there can be no excluded group. Um, I think what, what, what is happening, and that's what you alluded to, you know, that funding is not enough, it's a, it comes in bits and pieces, and we don't leave lasting capacity behind. So we need to actually develop and coordinate. What happens is each donor with a small pot of money comes, does their project in one place, uh, uh, there, there are no scale up mechanisms. Some, some are brilliantly done, some are not that brilliantly done. And then they leave because they run out of funding and the project closes down. So there's need for some kind of coordination of effort, and which is, again, it's, it's a very complex uh, situation because sometimes they say that it's, it's the government in the driving seat. Now when you put the government in the driving seat, do the, there could be go governance issues. There could be, again, issues of, uh, you know, that's what we try to do because it's supposed to be government-led. Ultimately, it's the government. No NGO, no, n nobody on this planet can do anything unless there's government commitment. Countries where governments have shown commitment, there's been a sea change. The, uh, you have the Rwandas, you have so many countries, you know, government steps in, takes ownership, it gets done. But again, it's a huge challenge. Uh, so, so really, I think the dialogues have started. Uh, we've been, you know, uh, in intensively d uh, discussing, and there's going to be improvement, but it's going to come possibly in baby steps. So hopefully by 2030, I don't know. Siri? Uh, so uh, just to respond a little bit to your uh, questions about uh, resilience. So another paper we are working on uh, in the aid project or research on aid project. Uh, is that we look at um, wasting of children, so weight to uh, age, um, 
in uh, areas where you have seen drought. So not conflict, but drought is certainly a different crisis. And what we find is that children who live in areas um, that have received aid previously to drought, uh, we see uh, uh, have less wasting than children in drought areas not receiving aid. So there seems to be some sort of resilience building or coping capacity building through aid. Uh, but this is still uh, early paper, so we didn't present it here yet. Next time. Thanks for excellent questions. I won't address all three of them, but I wanted to make a short comment to the first question about um, what does attributable to conflict mean, although it was addressed to Aaron's presentation. I just wanted to uh, remind ourselves that there are so many ways of defining local exposure to conflict. So what we have been uh, using now is a definition of uh, 20 kilometer buffers and we're counting conflict events. Mm -hmm. But we can look at larger uh, exposure areas and we can look at uh, other um, time spans. I mean, there's no one size fits all definition of conflict. Also, um, we have looked, and I didn't have time to go into detail about this in my presentation, but another question is, what is more severe for access to maternal health services? Is it repeated events? with relatively low mortality levels? Or is it maybe one huge event with thousands of, uh, of deaths? That's another question. And we have um, played around with different um, definitions of conflict exposure. And overall, we find sort of the same effect that both uh, conflict intensity measured in terms of battle deaths and in terms of number of repeated events uh, is negative for access to maternal health services. But I also wanted um, to mention <laughs> in relation to this uh, tricky urban effect, you mentioned, Aaron, that conflict is more intense in urban areas, which can indeed be the case, but we still find this urban-rural difference when we look at additional conflict deaths. So that is not the whole answer to this puzzle. Thank you. Let's take a few more uh, up here, Olivia, in the yellow. <coughs> My name is Embry Howell, and I'm at the Urban Institute in Washington. And we just did a study with the Center for Global Development on <laughs> using very similar methods. We were looking at acute malnutrition in Nigeria, um, and we found a uh, substantial impact of conflict, weighting it in similar ways to the way you have. So it's interesting that parallel minds work similarly mm -hmm. <laughs> um, using the DHS and the SCAD data <coughs> on conflict. And um, we did find urban-rural differences, but we found stronger effects in rural areas. When we looked, however, at infant and child mortality, we found the stronger effect in the urban area. So we're puzzling the same thing you're puzzling. Um, we think it might have something to do with migration and the fact that we can't measure migration in the DHS, unfortunately. <laughs> so I guess uh, that's a methodological problem, but I wondered if you had any ideas or if perhaps that will be introduced in future DHSs. And also the question about uh, getting the attention of the um, government and the, uh, the leaders in the government and of course in Nigeria since many of us are studying Nigeria. I wondered if you had any ideas of how that could be done. Uh, can you uh, pass it across? Uh, there was a t t question across. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Anudhar. Um, I'm studying MPA from George Washington University and interning at the global health team at DAI. And uh, my question is to Gudrun. Um, so your project findings kind of, it came out that the births at medical facilities have decreased in conflict areas. But I was wondering that did you find any increase in the deployment of midwives or increase of, uh, you know, a birth attendance available at the home kind of for the home care? Okay, and let's take one more. Uh, is there one on this side? No, Danielle, how about right there? Thank you all for a very provocative and insightful panel. My name is Nefra Faltis, and I'm a child health advisor with USAID Global Health Bureau's Office of Maternal and Child Health and Nutrition. 
I have two questions for the panel. Um, first, I couldn't help but be struck by Dr. Ben David's helpful reminder that when it comes to child mortality, and we include not just direct uh, deaths from conflict, but also uh, child deaths due to uh, the indirect causes of conflict, that really inflates the picture of child mortality. And I'd been reflecting on that alongside the all too familiar sort of pie chart of causes of death of, uh, of children under five and how we typically see, you know, malaria, diarrheal disease, pneumonia, malnutrition, sometimes uh, disability gets more visibility, but we often don't see conflict in that pie chart. So my question for all of you then is, do you think that whether as donors, whether as advocates, program implementers, researchers, there's something that we could be doing to change the conversation or at least broaden the conversation to get conflict into that picture, onto that pie chart, including to bring humanitarian and development actors closer together. Uh, my second question is a question building on my colleague Smitha's uh, question about resilience. And implicit in a number of your comments, I heard the importance of social capital and social cohesion in strengthening the resilience capacities of individuals at the individual level, the household level, and community level, particularly where unfortunately institutional value chains in these contexts often fail, whether we're talking about the, the government or uh, public and private sector health systems. I'm curious if some of you could comment on the importance of community platforms in strengthening uh, resilience and, and to what extent your researchers, uh, your research has, has examined uh, the importance of community platforms uh, and working with communities uh, to bring excluded groups uh, into the picture to strengthen resilience. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start with Gudrun and then we'll go down the line. Okay, thanks again for excellent questions. So uh, the first question about uh, the DHS and uh, lacking information on migration, that is partly true, but there are some questions in many of these DHS, DHS surveys asking the response how many years they have lived in the current area of residence. So in our analysis, we have tried to uh, look at only the never movers, so to speak, or at least the ones who did not move uh, within the last five years before the time of the interview, so that we know that the siblings were indeed uh, born at the same place. But this does not ensure um, the fact that there could be, of course, temporary uh, movements. Maybe uh, a crisis happens and uh, women have to flee and hide for two months and then come back. And these things are obviously not captured in the DHS necessarily. And that is, of course, a potential problem. Um, when it comes to your question about the different uh, outcomes, we are quite restricted by the questions uh, in the DHS surveys uh, again, but there are two main indicators and I only talked about one of them in my presentation, namely access to institutional births. There is also a question whether the birth um, had um, a professional uh, medical um, present, and we have uh, looked at both outcomes and we find the same effect, but we do not have detailed information about uh, other potentially um, alternative uh, outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just briefly, I, th I think to your point, I think Gudrun's right that there are questions in, in the DHS about the, how long people have lived in their place of residence. I think they're a little bit Getting, they're not consistent, and they're a little bit more. They're getting phased out. If 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 you could talk to the DHS folks and tell <laughs> them to bring them in, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Um, and so you know, so that's one thing we did look at the again. So people who haven't moved, the the, the effect is still very much there. It's unclear what how migration is going to affect things. You can imagine that on the one hand. Uh, people who have the m more sort of capacity will, just, will will move out of an area of conflict. On the other hand, you can imagine that the migration itself is going to be very taxing mm -hmm. uh, for families. Um, uh, and so, you know, it's it's it, you know it's it's unclear exactly how that's going to affect. You know, on on the cause of of death, I think you're uh, you know it's actually an important point that I I, I hope at some point is going to become. Uh, is going to come out of this work is that, you know, if you look again at the, the burden of disease, the cause of death, 
the direct, you know, direct deaths from, from conflict are, are relatively small, but there are the causes of the causes, right? And that's a little bit what we're talking about. Um, and so in terms of where to put conflict as, as sort of in, in the spectrum of, uh, of causes and risks, it's, you know, it's probably not a, uh, you know, it's not a direct cause. It's, uh, it's much more commonly going to be uh, something that increases risk of, of other causes. Um, and so that, you know, that's, that's a little bit where I sort of uh, see the, the, the place for this. It's not been much of the discussion in part because even in c very conflict-affected countries like Congo and even Afghanistan and whatnot, you still see child mortality going down. Um, and so there is some confusion about how, you know, how, where do you put it in and, and in what role. Uh, but, you know, anyways, that's your point. Uh, thanks for your uh, really good questions. Um, the question about how to get attention of the Nigerian government, I think that would be, <laughs> I would be uh, rich if I knew that. But my experience with Nigeria, which is uh, limited compared to others, I assume, is that Nigeria is a country who has a lot has the institutions in place compared to a lot of other conflict countries. It's just that it lacks a lot of will. So I think Gita's uh, or comment about if the government and the political will is in place, it's it, Nigeria would probably be much better off than they are. And so they, because they have the institutions and infrastructures. Um, related to the questions uh, about social platforms and uh, resilience is that we do find that education and wealth and a lot of these social uh, economic factors do also affect, of course, the health outcomes, which is why we, in our studies, do not only look at health aid, for example, because we do argue that uh, educational aid, agricultural aid, all uh, affect health outcomes. So it certainly is important for the infant mortality to educate the mothers. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, just briefly, I like your point about causes of causes. I mean, I think when we're looking at burden of disease, we can't put indirect causes as a direct cause. But, you know, this question for me, my main takeaway from this panel is, you know, how does conflict interact with other causes of causes to increase this risk? Um, in terms of government, I think, you know, clearly that's, you know, huge question. I think what I would just say, maternal child survival program works extensively in Nigeria at state level, district level, front lines, community, national level. And I think that um, in a country as complex in any country, it's, uh, it's really building relationships and trust and working at all levels of the government over time in partnership with other partners. Now, I don't pretend to sound naive and that there's some magic bullet, but I do think that that's you know, an, an, a tremendously important piece of that. And I think that's where some of the uh, development support in Nigeria, you know, it really has invested, I think, in these long-term relationships. When you were saying uh, prior aid predicts future aid, I mean, I wonder if that's part of it, too. You know, it's just developing these, these relationships and trust at all levels. Um, and then I think in terms of uh, your question about community and resilience, I think it's a really important point. Um, and I wonder, having just looked at, you know, been looking at some of the evidence showing that some of these community-based interventions are, in fact, the most effective in terms of increasing utilization or proximal health outcome measures that, you know, that has a lot to do with it. I'm going to also add a little bit to the community resilience and the community platforms. Uh, the women-friendly spaces that I so spoke about, the psychosocial support, I mean, that's absolutely key. The families have been completely uprooted. They've, they've lost everything. So that, um, in fact, in Bangladesh, it's called Shanti Khana. There's a very nice film that has just been produced uh, literally last week. It's not been released as yet. Um, you know, it's really providing a space. The person has to, I mean, even, even globally, we are seeing that bulk of the disease is, you know, it's a, it has a... Um, you know, it has a psychosocial impact. I mean, there's a lot of evidence. So those psychosocial support centers, I think, are playing a big role. And we also in introduce the uh, the behavior change. We try to affect it little by little. This Ramos study, which I told you I got hold of just last night, um, th there's an element in, the, in this. Th this is a protocol that is going to be introduced to collect data on the ground. Uh, they are introducing also what is called social autopsy. 
this I had not seen. Perhaps it happens in countries, but the social autopsy is really uh, looking at communities, uh, you know, informants, uh, community health workers, the the f uh, the, the faith-based workers, uh, imams, etc., um, and also people living in the communities as such who who are trying to see. Um, you know what is preventing women from accessing the health uh, the healthcare facilities um, j just to mention uh, again i got that figure from this report it's about 22% of the people are accessing the healthcare facilities that are there. So we have about 42 and about 22%. So if you look at the national average, uh, which is around 50%, so th that gives you a sense directly. Uh, but again, that's an estimate. I think you'll get a better estimate when this protocol is applied because these are you know, just, uh, just very broad estimates. So it's, uh, it's about 40% lower in 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 the in the conflict ridden communities um so let's see uh, i mean there are examples uh, again it's a question of really documenting them and taking them to to scale <clears throat> well we're at about time uh, I just want to say that this has been fascinating uh, for me, as I hope it has been for all of you. Uh, it's always intrigued me um, or concerned me a little bit that sometimes we privilege uh, d deaths uh, from conflict over other kinds of deaths. I mean, what does it matter to a family if their mother or their child dies, you know, one way or another, they're, they're, they've lost that person. But understanding the causes and, and the causes of those causes are critical to understanding how we can help uh, those families uh, stay together and, and stay uh, alive in the midst of uh, the chaos and uh, disruption that, um, of crisis and conflict, such as Gita talked about. Um, I want to uh, thank tremendously to all our panelists, uh, and then as well to uh, Prio and to Henrik uh, for bringing his team here to share this great work with you. And please do pick up the copies of the briefs that are outside. Uh, please share the video of this event uh, with your colleagues. Uh, and as well, there will be a summary of it uh, later to also share as well. So please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.